Welcome back to Vox Popcast, the weekly pseudo-academic roundtable of pop culture analysis with drinking and swearing. My name is Christopher Maverick, but you can call me Mav, and I am once again here with my co-hosts, Wayne and Hannah. How's it going, guys? Hey, Mav. Well, if you really must know, I have a headache. Oh, oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not good. I, I, get, I get those. But you're you're COVID immune now, right? Or so you theoretically are not dying. You just have a well, headache. Well, like by by the time this episode airs, I will have gotten my second shot. Um, okay. But I, I have a headache. I, I can tell you exactly why I have a headache. It's because I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. And, and you know, when you're tired, your head hurts. Um, and this is extremely boring. And none of our listeners care. <laughs> I'm trying to see if I could turn that into a transition. If, well, I, if you think what, you have a headache now, wait for the end of this episode. <laughs> oh no, I wasn't even, think, I wasn't even thinking that. I, I was. And with that, was, you can you can just turn it off and give us a five star review on iTunes. <laughs> I was trying to think of a clever pop culture reference of you know, can you fix headaches? Um, I don't know, you know, superhero powers or something. But fine, you know, <laughs> so, like I, I, I was like trying to work my way towards like a Vita Ray thing, <laughs> which is uh, you know what you know you know what causes headaches in Africa? academics what? superhero thought experiments there you go perfect <laughs> <laughs> uh and that's what we're talking about this week conveniently wow that was seamless and wonderful we are professionals <laughs> <laughs> um so this is um this is an interesting topic i think and this happened this happened for a couple of reasons well first i was having an argument with people on a facebook post just one of those really stupid arguments where um where I was just like thinking about Star Wars and the Mandalorian. And I was talking about Luke Skywalker being a genocidal maniac who just likes doing murder. And that's like why he does most of the decisions that he makes during Star Wars. And then people got mad at me about like, no, 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 he's not a maniac. He's, you know, he's fighting evil and he's doing this. And I was like, and so, you know, of course I doubled down on it. I'm like, he's a terrorist trying to take over the legitimate government. And he's like, and I'm like, no, but he's evil. I'm like, yeah, but nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. So, so I just kind of, you know, Luke likes doing murders. Luke murders a lot of people that he doesn't have to murder. He just enjoys it. And, and this went on and on. And then I started thinking this could be a show. And then I remembered a friend of ours wrote a book <laughs> about, about this very thing and sent it to me. <laughs> and it was like, you know, if, do you guys want to do a show on this? And then I thought, yes, I do want to do a show on this. And then there was a pandemic and it like took up all of our shows for like six months and we forgot to do that show. So we're doing this show now. Well, well time is meaningless anyway. So <laughs> I think I'd like to welcome back to the show. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> what, you want to try that again? Yeah, you want. To. Uh, yes, <laughs> and I'm not editing that out. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to welcome back to the show Chris Gobbler. <laughs> hey Chris, how's it going? Oh man, how are you? <laughs> well, I'm, I am I am bad at podcasting. That's how I am. <laughs> so yeah, you haven't been on in a while, but um just pretend you're in a bar having a beer. Uh, well, half that's true. Um, I don't remember what bars look like. It's been a long time. Um, so so you yeah, you have a little bit of expertise oh, here yeah. as I was saying. <laughs> I do. I do. I, I co-wrote a book on this subject. So, yeah, I've, I've half the expertise. The other half is here at Happily, too, though. So you co-wrote oh, the book, God, and okay. I was going to say, you know, we should get I your co-author here. on. But conveniently, I guess he's here. Um, also, in addition to Chris, we have Nathaniel Goldberg. Hey, Nathaniel. Nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Coincidentally, I also yeah. co-wrote a book on, <laughs> on this very topic. Yeah, hi, it's very nice to meet you. <laughs> that is such an odd coincidence that yeah, how did that hey, happen? Chris, Chris, yeah, Chris, you and I should get together sometime. Fowler, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, likewise, likewise. I I, uh, I hear your last name rhymes with squalor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, yeah, Chris has to remind me just inside baseball. I always say Gavler at first, and then it's like, no, it's Gavler. I which which I know because I've known you for like five years. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's not just inside baseball. That's like that's all sports. No one has ever correctly pronounced my name ever. <laughs> my students, I just finished a semester teaching in the last day class they're calling me mr gavalier i'm like yeah whatever go with that (laughs) just go away now (laughs) so anyway we should start with why hannah made her horrible sigh at my very obviously how luke is a homicidal maniac comment (laughs) 
because that because that's true. I mean, it's undoubtedly true. We all agree. Um, why? What's what's wrong with me saying that, Hannah? Oh, I just thought, is he going to talk about the subreddit? The Empire did nothing wrong. So, oh, um, no, no. The, imp- the Empire totally does things wrong. I just don't necessarily think that the rebellion is just right. My entire point was we are positioned to think the rebellion's right because, you know, they're they're our heroes. They're the protagonists. But really, the the rebellion are a bunch of people trying to overthrow the government. Like most people don't know that the emperor is evil. Like most people on the outer on the outer rings of the of the system, just you know, they're just trying to live their lives. And I know that because I've watched The Mandalorian, which is the whole plot to that TV show. <laughs> so, like, I, I it's not that I think Luke's wrong. I think Luke's doing a very good thing. And sometimes in war, people die. But he's still a terrorist. That's not even a thought experiment. That's just a straight up description of Star Wars. That's just that's just correct. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, so so maybe so, maybe we need to to go into this with an operational definition of what do we mean by by thought experiment. That would be my next question, right? Maybe that's a, a tip to me. But first, if I can ask, he's a terrorist because of the Death Stars. That's what you mean, right? Because he doesn't go around. He's not Papa, right? He doesn't go around slaughtering sand people and yes, he does. Other um, he killed. When? He killed a bunch of. He built a. He killed a bunch of perfectly innocent people. Um, you trying again. to rescue Han Solo. Oh, on Jabba's barge. <laughs> yeah, those people. Those uh, people were. They were colluding with Jabba. I don't think they were innocent. Who were hanging, there were people who were hanging out at the bar, the only local <laughs> yeah, bar well, in the bad. Hang, who, it's the bad part of town. Out? I there, who there, else would hang out on t- no, come on, it's yeah. Tatooine. They're lower class people. They uh, cannot exactly. control. They no, I mean lower class. Just they're just the working class people, and the local bar is owned by a gangster. It's what happens. You can't help it if you live in the hood. I'm sorry, and they're just there trying to live their best lives. You know, you're just a waitress trying to make your living on Jabba Stand Barge, and then you know, laser sword dude comes and just slices you up for no good reason. You know, so it's um, it's it's laser wizard dude, and I think we could tweak this just a bit. Uh, to bum 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 make it into a thought experiment that's what i was hoping yeah so so here's an attempt we can wonder did luke do the right thing by freeing han even though there was um arguably um um, collateral damage and the the usefulness of turning that into a thought experiment is we could then figure out what's the moral value of collateral damage without talking about particular cases from past or present. Mm-hmm. So by putting it off in a, in a fictional scenario, we can have a bit more fun with it and we can also remove it from the, the nitty gritty, sometimes really depressing facts of everyday life. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so this mm-hmm. basically lets us talk about moral philosophy of mm-hmm. with, without dealing with looking at an actual war or say you know a bunch of people who don't understand how elections work trying to overthrow a government if that sort of thing were to ever happen it allows us to unpoliticize (laughs) well and that's kind of what i think is interesting i think it allows us to unpoliticize it except for the people who end up looking bad why do you put politics in star wars i I guess what i mean by that is is it takes it away from the specific political (laughs) political I can't say politicization. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. But you yeah, could, it, you could it, also, you could also understand it from the other perspective. So right. what, what philosophers do and philosophical ethicists in particular is they often start from the perspective of pure theory and they're mm-hmm. looking for a way to make the theory meaningful. So on the one hand, as you're saying, we don't want to be, you know, ground down in the sometimes politicized or emotionalized um, or controversial parts of history. But on the other hand, we don't want to be just pure theoreticians because, well, that's fun for me. Uh, I've got a PhD in philosophy. It's probably not fun for most people. So, yeah. So Chris and I had this thought um, that, hey, comic books are doing this really, really well. Oh. I think so. that, that was your cue, so, Mr. Squalor. I'm still, I'm, I'll be honest. I'm still thinking about killing waitresses. Um, and so I'm trying to, okay, our first chapter focuses on Batman and Superman looking at their first years back in 1938, 1939, and just trying to apply the question of like, are they, what ethical approach, what approach to morality might character be following? And I'm trying to apply this to um, Luke at this moment as he's um, killing Jabba's employees, and I'm actually not sure how to run it. Um, Batman and, and Superman, at least, are actually surprisingly clear in their, um, what appears to be, the, or what can be derived as their philosophical uh, ethical approaches. Um, and they're really 
interestingly opposite. At least in their first year. Yeah, we we we, we clarify really early on that, like, talk about. Mm-hmm. I mean, generally, we as a culture talk about superheroes and uh, fictional characters generally as if they're coherent, consistent characters. But you know, there's as many Batmans as there have been writers and artists. You know, adapted them. So we just only looked at the first year. Bill Finger and um Bob came for Batman, mm-hmm. and um same for um Schuster and Siegel's Superman. These characters are um brutal. Uh, they are killers. Um, you know, we started by talking about Luke killing a lot of people, but Batman and Superman, the death count in their first year of um action comics and um detective comics, uh, the body count's extraordinary. These were these were uh, pretty bloody um characters. They either directly killed people, allowed people to die, or um were just seemingly indifferent uh, to a uh, number of deaths. Um, so we were trying to understand, particularly given that complication, in what sense are these characters uh, moral? And Mav, I mean, your question about um, Luke is like a terrorist. Um, it's a good question. It sort of applies to superheroes, too, because they're all, or maybe not all, but I will just say overwhelmingly the genre is uh, vigilante, um, romanticized vigilantism. So Luke as a terrorist mm-hmm. is a kind of vigilante as well, um, working against a, let's say, corrupt government. But that's, you know, that's what Zorro was. And then, you know, I mean, Superman aren't fighting against the government, but the government, in his, particularly in his early years, are shown to be incompetent and at worst uh, complicit. And so it requires mm-hmm. a vigilante to come in and fix. And so that's actually, so that makes Batman, Superman, and Luke uh, really very similar as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. Wait, so yeah. can I ask, can I ask a side question real quick? So, so you're saying I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with like early Superman comics. So you're saying that Superman is actually a violent character, and Zack Snyder's version, where everyone was like Superman doesn't kill people, is actually like closer to like his origins than we might think. This is very important to me for a reason. Totally, yeah. I was, I, yeah. No, I remember when everyone got upset about Zack Snyder, where um, you know, he in order to prevent a family from being slaughtered, uh, he kills Zod, right, General Zod. If that's, I think that was the scene that got everyone upset. Oh yeah! The, the <gasps> spoilers! 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 spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Would have just unthinkingly uh, slaughtered Bond. You know that was that was a no brainer. There yeah. was no um there was no issue there. Yeah. So the um the no kill Superman came years later. Years the original. Like, yeah. Like um, instead of people dying. Superman starts starts being hesitant to kill around. So Superman premieres in thirty eight, and he's like hesitant to kill by about the time the war starts. So it's about it's like six or seven years. It's not like 50, you know, but um, but yeah, yeah but the original Superman is all about, you know, well, you know, yes, the guy died, but he deserved it because he was, you know, charging too high rent. Yep. You know, yeah, so, yeah. See, he's like, talking landlords, <laughs> tossing landlords off roofs. And- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's really the original Superman is extremely Marxist and, you know, and, mm. and very much and the ends justify the means. Yeah, I was exactly going to say that because that's what Chris and I figured out. Mm-hmm. That Superman does represent that that ethical view. The ends justify the means. Mm-hmm. And if you want a fancy word for the view that focuses only on the consequences, it's called consequentialism. Ooh. So that's what we argue. <laughs> uh, which, which is why, by the way, um, Mav, maybe you think Luke was, in fact, you said Luke was justified. Um, I think you said that because you're a consequentialist and you think that um, he was a terrorist, but it brought about the best results. I, I certainly was for the duration of that Facebook post. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, 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 just for the record, put my cards on the table. Somebody on somebody in this discussion does follow the uh, the subreddit the empire did nothing wrong i'm not saying it was me but, but it might it might be um, but i actually was not me uh, well, 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 I mean, that, that doesn't narrow it down that much but i think there's another way of understanding what luke was doing the way that i was pushing and i think that mm-hmm. brings us to the way we were reading batman so mm-hmm. i think that there were no at least for the purposes of this discussion, that there were no innocent people on the barge because there are plenty of things you can do on Tatooine. You could be a moisture farmer, for heaven's sakes. You don't <laughs> need to cohort with, you know, with, with Jabba and do all those dastardly deeds with him. Well, so I'm, wonder, I I'm think, wondering about that, though. Well, hold mm-hmm. on, though, because because uh, you're talking about you're talking about Tatooine. So this is, a, this is a flaw in the way Star Wars works, right? Um, we tend to talk about each planet like it's a city. Tatooine's a planet, right? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about like, you know, Uncle Owen and not Baru are landowners. It's crap land, but it's land, right? I'm talking about the, I'm talking about
about the mother of three, single mother of three, who's just trying to make ends meet. And she lives, you know, she lives, you know, in a place where her her choices are Jabba's or most Isley. And most Isley is, you know, not hiring and also not the safest place in the world either. Because remember, Luke and his friends terrorize that place, too. So I think I think you're forgetting that we everybody in the Star Wars universe forgets. Um, good, good thing you've got uh, somebody uh, here to, to remind us that Tatooine is not just any other planet. It's the most important planet in the whole universe. <laughs> right? It's the planet where the chosen one was born. Remember when Shmi was visited by that that really romantic beam of light that, that mm-hmm. never gets explained. <laughs> and, and remember then his his son is brought there. Um, mm-hmm. Right. And I'm hearing the tune in my head. And then then there was that Ray person that, that yeah. lots of us have confusing feelings about. Um, she decides to go there, too. So I think I think Tatooine is a world of pure imagination. <laughs> I think you can be all you can be on Tatooine, which is why I think that Luke <laughs> was justified, not because the consequences worked out, but because those people chose to be there. So they <laughs> signed up for what they were going to get. So Luke respected their rights, respected their responsibilities. And they got what they deserved. It's not mm. the consequences. It's that, well, he did the right thing because they deserved to get job as fate. And that's like, ethical theory number two, which says <laughs> people should get what they deserve regardless of consequences. Because Luke did his duty to try to bring down the Empire, not because of the consequences, but because they were bad people. You know, I, I can see how Watchmen came out of these other comic book <laughs> histories <laughs> in terms of philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> Just to you know, jump the gun there. Well, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you're say so you're getting to like moral objectivism, right? Like that's mm, yeah. sort of, sort of. I mean, consequentialists can say that it's objectively good if people live, and objectively bad if they die. Right. But no, I, I mean, more like who cares about the the consequences? Luke had to try. Uh, you know, Jabba was a crime lord. Even if Luke failed to stop him, he still had to try. Jabba was a crime duty. lord, but Jabba was yeah. a crime lord, but he's not really trying to stop Jabba. He's trying to save his friend, a fucking he's, criminal that that screwed over Jabba. <laughs> like, ah, but I'm, he's got he's he's got a duty to protect his friend because his friend protected him. Yeah, so he's returning the favor, right? Oh, and the, but the point here is that even if he failed to save Han, that doesn't matter. Luke still had to try because it's not the consequences; it's the intent behind it. And that's what we were reading into Batman. Okay. Um, yeah, think about think about little little Bruce kneeling at his um, bedside praying, saying he will dedicate his life to avenging his parents. Um, he will war on crime. He um, but the odd thing about that, side by the fact that Jessica's so messed up, um, <laughs> really disturbing story. Um, I mean, it really, really is. That's a messed up kid. Um, it, he Batman then goes on and fulfills that duty. What is really striking about the first year? Okay, you're going to really say what I was going to say. I, I think you're going to say what I was going to yeah, say. Go ahead. Yeah, Batman is indifferent to um death. Oh, that's not what so, like when the first time he fights Joker. Mm-hmm. Um, Rob, you know, so someone's killed. He's like, oh, this sounds interesting. Let's investigate. Uh, they figure out who's going to be killed next. And Robin's like, so are we going to like wait inside and prevent the murder? And Batman says, no, no, we're going to wait outside so that after he kills this guy, we'll get him while he's escaping. Right. <laughs> and Robin's like, OK, um, which is, you know, because his duty is to war against criminals. Wow. He is not duty bound to save people, which is, you know, he's not focused on consequences of like what I do will have a positive outcome while I protect the innocent. He's not a champion of the uh, of the innocent. He's just warring on criminals any which way that you know happens to work out. That's his only requirement. And he lives up to that duty pretty well, but it's a strange duty um, and really contrast Superman, even though they both end up killing lots of people, but for very different reasons. I have a small quibble with that, actually, because I would say that <laughs> Batman does say that he's, you know, warring against crime. But I think that's, you know, for that first year, first two or three years, actually, I'd say a lot of that's kind of bullshit because where I think Superman's very much, you know, your working class Marxist underdog hero in, you know, at least in 1938, 1939, 1940, yeah. Batman is, he says he's worn against criminals, but really mostly he's trying to protect capital. Like his first several stories are all, well, you know, all the criminals that he's fighting are, these guys are trying to, you know, these guys are trying to steal this factory. These guys are trying to steal these diamonds. These yeah. guys are trying to, yep. you know, Batman doesn't really help poor people early on. Batman is very much about, <laughs> about helping, you know, industrialists. Um, the kind of people yeah. Superman's, Superman's out there, you know, 
literally Superman is out there literally going to war against, you know, reckless driving. <laughs> Superman. Yeah, yeah. It literally, yeah. yes, yes. If Superman sees you driving erratically, then you deserve to be dropped off a building. That's, you know, they, because that's how Superman solves problems in, in 1939. Um, but Batman yeah. is ba- Batman is very much like, you know, well, you are doing a dirty business deal and this guy is doing clean business deals. So I'm going to drop you in a vat of acid. That's that's Batman's (laughs) his his moral. So the morality in both in both cases, I I I buy into what Nathaniel said about consequentialism, right? Like I buy into the fact that both of them very much believe the ends justify the means. It's a little. I I do think that like I think the morality. Maybe actually, I'm not sure. Does the morality behind their um, their ideology matter? So, so Mav, I want to I want to push back a bit. And actually, something that Hannah said, uh, I'm going to jump the gun that she already jumped. I think in a way, a better example of the other view besides consequentialism is from Watchmen. And that man, it, it gets complicated, not only because he's been around for decades, but because uh, he seems to act differently when he's Bruce Wayne from when he's Batman. I mean, he seems morally to act dif- differently. But in the Watchmen, I think the example is clearer. So if you think of Rorschach, who he says that the truth matters, people must be told. And um, if you remember the story, there's this big consequential thought experiment. What if we could save billions by sacrificing millions? And Ozymandias thinks, yep, that's a good deal because net balance is positive. More people are saved. So kill, you know, kill everybody. And Chris, help me. New York? No. What, what cities get? New York. Yeah, New York. New York. New York. It's a heck of a town, right? So it just goes up in smoke. The- Sorry? Well, giant blue space, yeah, <laughs> right, right. So that's that's consequentialism because it's still the greatest good for the greatest number. Consequences, net positive. But Rorschach says, nope, I don't care about consequences. I don't care if there's World War Three. People must be told because I have a duty to the truth. Mm-hmm. And that's not a consequentialist view that if you want a fancy term, that's called deontology because mm-hmm. it's got the word for duty in it. So the Greek word for duty is in deontology. So Rorschach thinks he has this duty or obligation to the truth. Consequences be damned. And we were reading first year Batman that way, but better example might be from the Watchmen because Ozzy and Rorschach are, are polar opposites in terms of moral theory. And the contrast with Rorschach is really important, I think, because, um, you know, we read him as a, a descendant of Batman, but the fact that he is perfectly willing to allow World War Three, and within the context of the graphic novel, the likely destruction of the human race, rather than uh, subvert the truth that the giant blue squid was all fake and, you know, none of this, this is all uh, make-believe, um, regardless of what happened. It's a, it's a pretty radical, it's, it's a perfect example of a thought experiment because it takes an idea and inflates it to its uh, to such a huge degree that the contrast is massive. Um, he's fine. He's actually even fine with his own death. Um, when um, Doctor Manhattan kills him, he's he's down with that. He's like, yeah, I, I will not. I will not try to save my own life. I'd rather die and while performing what I am duty bound to do. And if it means my death, fine. If it means the death of the human race. Okay. Um, he's good with it. All the other characters turn out to be consequential. So one good thing about using thought experiments like this is, gosh, there's this problem when you talk about ethics, there's this tendency to to go to the like the, the Hitler and the Stalin stories. And yeah, those make great examples, I, I guess. But at a certain point, uh, what, what's that joke that, uh, gosh, was that like a Marvel Cinematic Universe joke from, was it Winter Soldier or whatever, that there were still Nazis in the, like in the, the year 2010 or whatever it was. And turns out there were Nazis in the year 2020, right? In real mm-hmm. life. Um, but anyway, yeah. right. Um, but that's, the, yeah. yeah, no, scary, but that that's, that's history. And like, literally it's in the past and it's not as vivid to people um, as these stories might be. And it's also got loaded and it has all the complications of genocide and racism. And, and here, if you pit a story between, so here's a fictional character who thinks killing a million people it's, or several million, it's worth it. And here's another character who thinks, well, if, if everybody dies, it's worth it. Right. And one of them thinks that because he's doing a balance sheet, he's, he's counting up consequences. The other one thinks it worth it's worth it because he doesn't care about consequences. He just cares about his duty. But I, I do. I wonder about I mean, you know, uh, Watchmen is fiction, but that graphic novel in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, shocking. 
Uh, that, that graphic novel in particular does draw on, like, I, I guess, you know, the, the past, uh, like, like American history and the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, immediate present. And like, you know, Rorschach, we've talked about this a lot on this podcast, um, is like steeped in like neo-Nazi or KKK white supremacist propaganda. Mm-hmm. So like how yeah. abstract really are these thought experiments? I mean, they're they're removed from reality in some ways, but... Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no, you're right. So it's a, it's a balance that, well, of course it depends on the context. If you're, if you're looking just for, for fun, then you know, read whatever comic book is fun to you. But if you're looking to try to get a, a philosophical lesson out of it, it's hard um, because, well, I mean, let me ask you, do you all know about the, this accursed philosophical thought experiment, the trolley problem? Mm-hmm. Well, we watched the good place. A, yeah. So philosophers have been talking about the trolley problem for decades and it's become so there's so many different versions of it and they're so abstract because mm-hmm. you're supposed to imagine, you know, there's you, there's somebody on the train track, there's a train coming, there's somebody on another train track. What would you do? And that's so far removed from real life that it's, it's not even clear that your thoughts there are relevant to actual right. situations, you know, like self-driving cars or situations where this really matters. How do you program a car? You know what right. to do? You want believable stuff like fighting giant squid. Absolutely. I'm on, I'm on board. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the balance you have to strike because uh, gosh, Churchill was an anti-Semite. So was Roosevelt yet. They signed up to fight against Hitler who was more of an anti-Semite. So, so what do you do when the history is just so messy? You can't always have these clean, you know, black and white, but you're right. The trolley problem is too black and white. So, Mm -hmm. so we were thinking that fiction in particular comics, because they're words and images can help enliven the thought experiment enough and complicate it maybe enough so that we can get something ethically interesting out of the mix. And not just ethically. We uh, look at philosophical thought experiments along multiple lines. Just um, Our first section is on ethics, but after that we explore into um, a range of metaphysics, and it's uh, the world of philosophy is wide open. So the uh, the ethics is just um, door number one. So Chris, let's let's talk about uh, time travel, because that was also... Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, yeah. Um, the Hitler story. So, um, you look at Marvel, and of course, there's so many time travel stories within um comics. Generally, we tried to sort of figure out can we just do one thread? So, we went to the first Marvel time travel story, which is uh, Fantastic Four uh, with Doctor Doom's time machine, and then we looked at I won't say every single Doctor Doom time travel story, but pretty damn a close. lot of them. Um, and there's a oh my god, are there a lot of them? And it's a uh, it's fun because. Marvel, of course, if you're looking at, there's nothing coherent or consistent about this um, because it's a bunch of different writers and editors. And so every writer and, uh, and artist, too, could have a different take on time. But our premise was we were treating Marvel as a single entity, um, as a philosopher, and trying to derive the so what philosophy of time does Marvel present uh, through these um, Dr. Doom stories. And it's interesting to watch because it, it appears to be a philosopher whose uh, attitude towards time is evolved um, because with every few years, a new story would introduce what would appear to be a new philosophy towards time. And then eventually they all got merged and then recorrected. And um, it's it's a wonderful, wonderful mess. <laughs> um, it's, it's one of the more complicated. We tried to, at one point I tried to graph it and I just you know, lost my mind. But um, yes, and that's just that's only looking at Doctor Doom. Um, do we want to? Um, do do, shall we break down the different? Yeah, well, I thought of I thought Dr. Doom? I thought I could make it make it simple. And Chris, you can jump in if I forget the comic mm. specifics. But the tell me, wasn't it something like the very first time travel story? The Fantastic Four try to go into the past to change the past, right? Mm-hmm. Wasn't wasn't that? Yeah. And uh, it turns out they couldn't because the the writers of the story or the the metaphysics of the Marvel universe at the time was what we might call eternal or eternalist. And eternalism is the view that everything happens eternally. So what happened in the year 1800 always happens in the year 1800. And what happens in the year 2021 always happens in the year 2021. So things can't be changed. Time is like space. All the points are already laid out before you. Time doesn't so like lost. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so that's a fandom I, oh God, I skipped, yeah. but uh, I'll take your word for it. No, no, I'm, I'm with you with Lost, but Lost is so bizarre. But yes, more or less like Lost. The example with uh, Fantastic Four is that they went back to um, uh, 
to get blue Blackbeard. That's right, Blackbeard. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Ben Grimm is blind. It always was. It always is, right. Exactly, always always is. It always was, and that's the key, is that um, unknown to him, when he'd heard of Blackbeard as a kid, he was actually reading about himself, but he just didn't know that. Mm -hmm. But he he has always been blind. He always has had gone back in time and been blackboard blackbeard in return to the place. Chris, we could even say it's not that uh, that Ben Grimm um, always went back in time; it's that he always does go back in time. So he, eternalism tells us to drop verb tenses. Everything is eternal. In eighteen hundred, this does happen. Nineteen hundred, this does happen. That's the point because it's always happening. That's, and that, that's, that, that's very much Alan Moore's take on on yeah. all, of, all of history through in Jerusalem and yeah, he, and Alan he, Moore he, uh, he wrote thirteen hundred yeah. pages about that idea in Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, Chris, Chris, t- Chris he, tells he me he's a, in Manhattan. Yeah, exactly. yeah, Chris, you tell me Alan Moore's read some philosophy, so maybe he picked it up there. Oh, he has. Yeah. Well, we can get to swamp things later yeah, if we yeah. have time. Read some philosophy, pray to a snake god that he knows doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Alan Moore's an it. I know, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you said it evolves, though. Because, yeah. like, that is, you've got the eternalistic um, point of view, which is fatalistic, but, like, Marvel moves away from that. They do, because then um, the Avengers... Um, <laughs> I'm forgetting who wrote these issues. These, this, uh, oh, uh, Roy Thomas. Um, he decides that uh, Captain America wants to go back and find out definitely whether Bucky died or not. Because in the 1960s, Captain America was really brought about Bucky. This is back when Bucky was still dead. Um, that changed. But um, he wants to go back and just observe. But it turns out that time isn't working the same way as it did for the Fantastic Four. It turns out that they can actually seemingly interact with people in the past in a way that alters what happened. Um, now, it gets wonky because there's still ways to read it as, well, maybe that always happened that way. But it appears that they're concerned that if they do more than observe, they will alter the timeline, which was not even a remote possibility from when the Fantastic Four traveled the time. So it seems that a different philosophy of time is at least in place. Butterfly effect. And that yeah. philosophy is called? It's called presentism, because at least in the general form, it says that only the present exists or is real. So when they travel back in time to what is our past, they're actually in the present. And the future doesn't exist. What's before them doesn't exist. There's just a moment in time that exists, and that moment is changeable. And then things around it would readjust. But... There's nothing that's eternal. That's, so you have to really imagine. And Chris and I, I guess, Chris, we didn't talk about this so much, but you have to imagine the time traveler goes back to a point and then that point becomes the present. And that's why the time travel can change it. Uh, and then if the time travel goes back, goes to what would have been the future, the future point that becomes the present for the time traveler. So there's only ever just the present that exists. So everything's up, yeah. up for grabs. They they use that that, that changing history thing that as the launching point for the multiverse as well. Just the mm-hmm. that whole you change one thing, it launches uh, off the multiverse. That the exiles well, and then, uh, but then they get they get weirder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Chris, you went out. Time. Yeah, yeah, branching time. Okay, so no, this this is key. So the, the, the um for a while they were saying that what's happening is that we're just going back in time and. What happens when you arrive at a point in the past, the timeline divides because you've appeared in the past and that alters the past and you've created a new timeline. That gets wonderfully messy. Mm -hmm. And there's actually that. It was John Byrne um, who explored this the most with Ben Grimm trying to go back in time, give himself a cure that would um, prevent him from having to be the thing anymore. It worked, but then he comes back to the present and he's still himself. And Reed is like, well, you big dummy. All you did was you say, that then grim you created a different timeline then around 19 we're up to about 1980 now um david byrne comes back to that storyline and changes it decides no ben grim did not create a new timeline he didn't cause time to branch he actually traveled to a distinct and pre-existing universe that happened to look identical to our universe mm-hmm. and he just didn't realize it and he went to this place that already existed cured that ben grim and that ben grim went on with his own life but that universe always existed so it seems that the dr doom's time machine changes from a time machine to a interdimensional travel device that always sends you to a place that looks almost exactly like the place you're trying to go in your own past but never mm-hmm. so there's actually then 
no time traveling going on in the Marvel Universe for a couple decades, at least using Doctor Doom's time machine. Um, it's this just multiverse travel machine. Which is, now we're moving away from philosophical thought experiments into, um, into the physics thought experiments where it gets a little oh, yeah. weird. But that is one one rough theory of time travel is that because of causality, you can like causality is maintained because it is impossible to not travel in space and time at the same time or to stay in one without uh, and change the other. You all a travel in time always always coincides with a with a travel in space, which makes sense because if you had to rewind like if you tried to go back in time from just this moment, um like um you would instantly crash into yourself. Like you would just be if you if you don't move and you go back in time, then you'll crash into yourself, you know, five minutes ago or an hour ago or, you know, or a year ago or, you know, like, and, and honestly, if you stay physical, you'd crash into it one second ago, the second you go back in time. So that doesn't work. You always have to move in time and space. And that lends to the mini world theory of time travel hmm. that doesn't lend to, that without branching without branching realities there's also and this gets into i can't believe i've done all this research and oddly enough i've <laughs> literally talked about this on my other show this week too um so i think that's in like probably in like three weeks uh, i don't know time travel in podcasting is weird too um, so um, <laughs> but um there's uh so you get into the the what many comic book fans know as the um as the multiple futures theory like you know you always the constantly branching time uh, time periods but uh modern theoretical physics also theorizes a multiple histories um theory so that it's not just that you have one timeline that split at a schrodinger cat moment um all all timelines are coming together at the schrodinger cat moment too so all you really know when you, you know, as we all move through time, you don't know what my past history is. I don't know what your past history is. It doesn't matter if they if they match up. All that matters is that we both get to that unique moment in time at the same time and then we can move on and we can move on. So you end up with this very very weird thing that is that is hard to explain like yeah. So my my explanation is always when I and when you see me give this presentation, right? My explanation is if I watch the really bad movie Batman versus Superman. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, and that is the official title: the really bad movie Batman versus Superman. <laughs> That movie doesn't explain Batman's backstory. It doesn't explain Superman's backstory, though we saw it in Man of Steel, right? The Batman that exists in that movie um, came from somewhere. And it doesn't matter if I have an awareness of Batman that comes from the Chris Nolan movies. It doesn't matter if I have the an awareness of Batman that comes from the Michael Keaton movies or um, the Super Friends cartoon or the Arkham Asylum video games or the comics or whatever, long as I have some prior history of Batman, I can get him to that movie without without really having conflict. And then I can get to the horrible Martha moment. Like, all I need to know is that he had a mother named Martha and any number of timelines can get me there. It doesn't matter what Batman's history is before he before he meets Superman in that moment. Only that I, you know, only that this is a Batman that hasn't met Superman before. Um, and there are many, many ways to get there. So I can start I can start at, you know, at early detective comics and then skip straight there. Or I can start at Michael Keaton movies and skip straight there or the Gotham TV show. Same thing for Superman. It doesn't matter. Like maybe I watched the Superman movie Man of Steel before I watched Batman versus Superman. Or maybe I watched the Chris Reeves movie. It actually doesn't matter within the context of Batman versus Superman. All that all that matters is I've gotten my idea of Superman somewhere and I've gotten my idea of Batman somewhere and they converge at that moment and then they can diverge again. It doesn't matter. And that's so, actually so, probably so, how real so time man, goes. So man, if I if I can ask you, um I have I haven't seen those movies. I've I pledged my soul to the other <laughs> to the other fandom. But um of course it of course it matters. It's gotta matter because if you're going to the point where uh what is it where Bruce sees Martha or whatever the example yeah. is, um mm -hmm. if if Bruce had a particularly tortured childhood, then he's going to be he's going to have certain beliefs in his head that are gonna differ. Mm -hmm from if Bruce had a really happy childhood. Right. So, right from the beliefs but, in his head. So right. of course oh, so it I, matters. I can't get there from all points, 
but I can get there from many points, right? It's just like well, driving sure. on the well, street. Well, yeah, well, you know, now I'm, yeah. well, now I'm yeah. going to play, you know, snotty academic and say, well, well, sure, you can get there from many points. Right. I just thought you were saying you can get there <laughs> no, from no. all points. No, no, no. no. Okay. I mean, it, it's okay, got okay. to be Batman, though. It can't be. It can't be. I mean, that guy has got to be Batman. We, we can't just assume that well, guy right, used to right, be the right. Flash. But it, can't, yeah. but it can't be a guy who's going to start be who's going to start killing billions of people. So if there's a Batman story that he grows up as a, I don't know, as a as a terrorist in you know the Shining Path in Peru, he gets trained in the mountains to kill mm. thousands of capitalists, and then he sees his mother and father die. It can't be that Batman, right? Because then that Batman is going to go off to try to find a nuclear bomb to destroy the world. So it can't be. I see what you're saying. He's got to be there. There are there are requirements that can get you to yeah, that path, but there are many paths right, that right, can right, get right, you right, there. Right, of course. Yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. I, and if I can point out, so what's interesting, Mav, about what you're describing is that if, for instance, you watch the terrible movie called Batman vs. Superman, having only seen Batman movies starring Bell Kilmer and or George mm-hmm. Clooney, which you left off your list, thank you, um, it doesn't matter, except it does matter in one sense. If you only read the first year of uh, Detective Comics with Batman versus seeing uh, one film of all the ones you named, your experience of Batman versus Superman will be qualitatively yes. different. You will, in essence, be watching a different movie, yes. which is interesting. Right. My experience, um, it will but that's be a the same thing. Coherent movie, my, I got to say, it will be distinct from Right. But, that, from but other that's movies. exactly the thing. Like, my, w- you and I both watched that movie. But my history of how I got to that movie is different from your history. So it is one fixed pom- moment in time, the runtime of the really bad movie, Batman versus Superman. But like the experience of how we each got there can be individualistic and therefore we might experience it. Some people foolishly believe that's a good movie because they arrived at that point in a different way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Here's the, here, I could give you two really, I mean, seriously annoying academic terms to describe what you've Perfect. Um, to, to name what you've just described. Chris, Chris, so, Chris, do they both start with the letter D? They do. Oh, it's yeah, like we just like wrote a book together. It's, 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 yeah. it's, a, it's a, well, a different book. A different though. book, yeah. That's okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So when you describe, because it's interesting, Mav, you said when you described that terrible movie, you referred to it by its um, length, right? I forget what you just said, um, which is wonderfully accurate. It's, it's, a, it's an object. Mm-hmm. Um, call it a discourse. Sure. It simply is an object. And until it's watched, it's kind of inert. It's just light and sound or whatever. But when someone watches and listens it, they experience something in their brain that is a diegesis. Mm-hmm. And everyone is going to experience discourses in, in, in that experience is called the diegesis. But no one's diegesis is going to be identical. Mm-hmm. They are going to overlap a whole hell of a lot, though. And sometimes so much that you would never even distinguish them. But you're actually setting up the possibility of if someone has read a completely different Batman and, you know, because these movies and comics can be quite different. Two people could, with different backgrounds could experience uh, Batman inside Batman versus Superman quite differently mm-hmm. and therefore have a very different diegesis. Which I believe is exactly you know, what happens. The same Which I believe is exactly yeah. what happens and explains all every fandom war ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so part of the, the, the book that Chris and I wrote um, looks a bit at topics like this in an area called philosophy of language, because even though movies aren't the um, same thing as, as books, um, thinking about them requires listening to them and understanding them in terms of language. And different people can approach the same story right, in, mm-hmm. in different ways. And that, that's a you know great example of Maybe that is why so many people fight over minutia because they're interpreting the minutia differently. Well, but I mean, isn't the even though we don't normally, unless you're a big giant nerd like the people in this room today, uh, <laughs> I like I don't know that we normally pick apart our stories on the level that we're doing right now. I mean, this is a um, it's an academic. Well, um, I mean, on the level we're doing specifically, where we're like, okay, what would Kant say about this, right? Like, okay, I don't yeah, know. That fair, that's, fair. Okay, but I do think where I was going with it is I I do think that isn't the idea of whether people realize it or not isn't the idea of these thought experiments why we watch you know particularly what currently geek content but I'd say all stories 
isn't that part of why we watched the story in the first place? So that um, we can I, sit there and go, what would Luke Skywalker do? What would Batman yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, that, that might be part of it, but I don't, I don't think Chris and I should overplay our hand. I think a big part of it is because, mm-hmm. because they're fun, right? Okay. Um, I mean, sure, sure, they get you to think about things, but I don't know if anybody's had this experience. I, I certainly have, where I, I go see a movie with a friend and I come out thinking, like, oh my God, what are the consequences of that? And, you know, my friend just says to me, consequences of what that was that was fun let's go get a burger right <laughs> it, so some people don't actually and that's perfectly fine so so, I, so, I, the, so the consequences are burgers gotcha well for some um, for yeah, some yeah. people they might be <laughs> you're duty bound to have a burger <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna try to bring something up and we'll see where it goes yeah. um but aren't there aren't there clearly like some forms of media that are written just as pure thought experiences uh, experiments specifically and i'm just gonna say the good place again um (laughs) because like it feels like a lot of episodes are like okay well what if we think about like what jeremy bentham had to say and we write an episode where we play this out and not only like teach people who don't read bentham in their free time like hannah um about jeremy (laughs) bentham but we also like think about the consequences of thinking the way he does and how that works or doesn't in this wacky kind of world so maybe there's a continuum and some media are more towards the thought experiment side and, and some are less. So I'm going to say something really embarrassing. Um, I've never watched The Good Place, no matter how many times Chris has told me to, because uh, I mean, like if you're a professional dog catcher, why would you like go look at, you know, puppies that are being given away for free? Right? I, I, you know, I teach philosophy as part of my day job. Um, but yeah, Hannah, maybe, yeah, maybe more people are going to watch it for that. I'm still thinking that there are probably some people who watch the show because they find the actors really hot. Right. Or there's some I'm people, almost certain of it. Yeah. So maybe there's a yeah. continuum and there that's well, more on the thought they're, experiment. They're, side. they're being thrown in the philosophy pool, even if that's yeah. the motivation. Like, like oh, people, right. yeah. I did not know that the good place was going to be as philosophy heavy as it was. I watched it because I liked the actors and I liked the cast because mm-hmm. like, I mean, like, you know, it's like Ted Dance and Kristen Bell. Like you probably know one of those names if you watch mm-hmm. TV. Um, Cheers or Veronica Mars. Um, mm-hmm. But then, uh, which I guess just shows you what a hopeless person i am uh first episode they were like caught on the metaphysics of morals and in my hand was the metaphysics of morals from when i had been working on my dissertation that same day <laughs> and oh, that's wonderful i knew there was a reason i liked you <laughs> it might be God, um, hannah, 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 hannah can i ask you a per- can i ask you a personal question yes are the are the I other people in the are the other people in this room with us, are they consequentialists? Mm. Mm. Because I'd be afraid to have my back turned to them. Right? <laughs> because, maybe, right? because maybe it would lead to the best consequences if they like knife me or mug me or something. Not till we stop recording anyway. No, no, I, no, no. Always, I always keep my copy of the groundwork actually in my back pocket to use as a shield. <laughs> if anyone comes up with a knife. I, I I I have a question of well okay and maybe it's a little bit of a I'm not sure if I'm agreeing with Hannah or pushing back so yes you yeah, you're pushing back you're, no, you're it's, always it's been, both you're always doing both so let's yeah yeah right. so you mentioned like you know you you go to the you go to the good place because you're a Kristen Bell fan you're a Ted Danson fan and then you're excited when they're talking about something that is more than that right and having done you know not only our good place episode but the other 156 episodes of this show with you um or the ones that, the ones that we were both on anyway like i know that you know you are the kind of person who will enjoy analyzing be it a good place or a lost or a wandavision or fucking you know literally anything we 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 talked about christmas on the square for like three solid weeks right <laughs> which you know which um, everybody else christmas on this episode ever. is just like what like, is like, that what? and you don't need to know it's the best, <laughs> but it's the best christmas movie ever and you should go see it so anyway so like i i get that okay. i get that you'll do that i get that i'll do that but you know we said well maybe like nathaniel you said sometimes you're going to say people are just going to watch something to just enjoy it and i would argue that I don't know that I don't know that that makes it not you know, it makes it more or less of a thought experiment so much as people mm. being obstinate. And my proof is Wayne having spent 
25 years of your life as a comic book um, retailer? Pretty like much, that, right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. 25 years as a comic book retailer. Can you tell me that you have never run into a person who is upset that Captain America has become too political? <laughs> How, how many millions yeah. of people have complained, have yeah. come into the store, say, why is Captain America pushing politics down my throat? Right. What, what, because it's yeah. as though that's as though, you know, he didn't used to do this back in the day. It's I, Captain yeah. fucking America. To be fair, I've encountered more of that on the Internet. I mean, you, you know, the store I worked at, which was right. between two universities. We had a different clientele than a lot of that. I'm not saying that never happened because it certainly did. Right. But in in general, our clientele was a bit more smarter. Yeah, but a bit smarter. Yeah. You know, I, I hate to say it that way, but it, it's kind of true. Um, where you know, these types of conversations, and you and I have been having these conversations in the store for 25 years. Part of where the show comes from. Yes. Yeah. It's part of where the show came from. Um, and I had these guys types of conversations with other people as well. But yeah, there, there were the few, you know, the, the ones who just didn't get that and, and just leave politics out of my comics and not realizing that it's always been there. And yeah. And well, I've yeah. seen that specific complaint about Captain America yeah. specifically oh, yeah. when like, so about five years ago, uh, Nick, Spencer was the author that took over Captain America and he started having um, I guess it's more I guess it's more like four years ago because it would have been right after Trump started his presidency. Red Skull started quoting Trump in the comic yeah. like re, yeah. like Red Skull like Red Skull was literally just like saying stuff that were just direct, direct quotes. very obvious references well, to like, things that like, Trump had like, 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 <laughs> like cuff ever. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> uh, remember the, no, the Scott, 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 was, Scott. Yeah, I was smarter than that. But yeah, uh, but basically, uh, he was just quoting MAGA stuff, and a bunch of people mm-hmm. got a bunch of people got really, really mad because Captain America is supposed to be about entertaining you. It's not supposed to be about politics. Why is the Red Skull doing this? And you know, and Nick Spencer's getting death threats because how dare you? You just go and, back to writing funny books, and, and I'm like, and, and, and you it's know, Captain I, America. It, that's it, all this ever was. I, I remember watching Richard Nixon kill himself in an issue of Captain America in 1974. You yeah. know? I remember him punching fucking Hitler. Right. And I did, and I did right. you know, We weren't even in the war yet. Like, that's the first thing he does. <laughs> like, so... I like so, I think so Mav, always Mav, have people Mav, ignoring I mean, it. I'm, Mav, I'm, I'm, ag- I'm agreeing with you that mm-hmm. you can you can certainly read into to any story, right? Chris and I, your diegesis can be as political as you want, but so but Captain America punching Hitler, what what thought experiment was that? Well, I don't know that it's a thought experiment. I'm saying oh, that oh. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that okay. pu- Captain America punching Hitler is was a, a directly political, statement, political statement, 1941. statement that like right, 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 right. That, but like, I, I th- yeah, See, I'm, people I'm, are ignoring. I'm being, so I'm saying, yeah. So I'm saying, if you yeah, can yeah, ignore, yeah, yeah. I'm being, you can, I'm being yeah, that, yeah. that that that's silly academic. And I thought you right. said that every everything was a thought experiment. No, 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 no. I'm so, saying, oh, okay, I'm saying, okay. I'm saying, if I'm saying, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that the. Uh, I like. I think the thought experiment is still there. Like somebody can just watch the Good Place, which is clearly a show about philosophical thought experiments. That's the entire premise. But maybe I just think Kristen Bell is really hot. You know, like yeah, no, it, I get, I get that. But you, yeah. you said that all fiction yeah, was. No, 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 so. no, I'm, no, I'm saying, no, I'm saying, uh, yeah, I didn't mean it that way. I meant like, oh, okay. and I meant like, does it stop? Like, I'm, I'm saying, does it matter what the audience is getting out of it in order to make it not be or make it be or not be? And I don't know that it does. Like, well, I think well, 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 it, as, 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 so you're arguing the author is not dead. Well, I'm, author, I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm arguing, I'm arguing, actually, I don't think it's about the author. I don't, cause I don't think the author intent I, I, matters I, either. I think, I think it's our, I think it's our diegetic thing. I'm, I'm I think it's, uh, I think it's, if yeah, I get to exactly. that place with, if I get to that place where I can make the cohesive thought experiment, it doesn't matter if you don't get it any more than it matters that you don't get mm. that the Red Skull is a political statement. He always yeah, was. It's, 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 it's the based you know the the person reading it you know any of us can watch this stuff or consume this stuff and turn it into a thought experience depending on our way of interacting with that text mm-hmm. okay doesn't mean you ha- doesn't mean you have that's to it exactly yeah so this is this is exactly what Nathaniel and I did when we started writing the book is acknowledging that no one has really ever read superhero comics 
as thought experiments, and I'm fairly sure that the authors never intended it to be read that way. We cared not at all. We, I guess creating our own diegesis, read them as thought experiments, and therefore they are thought experiments because that's the reading we're giving. So that's, that's sort of the mm -hmm. power, if you will, of a diegesis. It simply is the reading experience. So these are thought experiments because we're reading them as thought experiments, regardless of intention by the mm -hmm. author. And I would, I would argue that on the, I mean, the other way of looking at it is I think, I think more, for instance, is clearly trying to do that. Yeah. But if you yes. go back to our Watchmen episode, yes. Yes. a lot of his readers didn't get it right. Like there are a lot of people who just read it and saying a lot of people read Watchmen and said, oh, well, this is us telling us that we should behave like Rorschach and more is disgusted by that. <laughs> Cruz likes Rorschach, right? Yeah. That's the thing. <laughs> what, what was that? Uh, I was going to say Cruz likes Ted Cruz, like, like he loves Rorschach, right? Like that's a thing. Yeah. Oh um, God, does he? Yeah. I not, I didn't know that. Ted doesn't know. Oh yeah, I did not know that one. That's he, awesome. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll link uh it in the show notes. Um, but oh oh, he's actually using superheroes. I, it's a lot more complicated than I thought. It's um a lot. It's I don't know if I want to link to this, but I uh, will. Well, yeah, <laughs> he um he does he does believe that. He he watched Avengers Infinity War and Endgame and loved them because he believes that Thanos rec uh, represents the Democrat. Yes, that's, that's what, what, that's, what that yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, wow. that, that was his reading of it. He was like, oh, this movie justifies everything I believe because well, clearly that Thanos is the evil Democrats who are trying to cancel everything. OK, so so I'm going to bring up this goes back to you asking me about customers at the store. There's one in particular, but I, I saw this at, in two different people. There's one in particular when the Marvel Civil War storyline was coming out. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah, it, it, it struck me how everybody, no matter their political persuasion, identified with Cap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, to, to, to me, it was clear Tony is the industrial military, military industrial complex and, and you know, the. Guantanamo, you know, they're they're locking people up and he's very much representative of Bush administration and the conservative thought and whatever. And it was also true that was also very clear to both Mendes and Edward Baker from yeah, their right, note. Right, but the right, author is dead. Right, right. And 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 Cap was the more liberal kind of view. And I, I had a very conservative customer. And this, this is a guy I liked, I had a lot of conversation with him. He was smart, he was well read, and boy was he completely wrong with politics. <laughs> yeah, but, but we had a lot of debates and that at times got heated. Um but he just completely saw Tony as overreaching democratic government interfering with individual freedoms. And I, like he's so he's so clearly conservative military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. But 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 I started paying attention to conversations. And once again, store in the middle of two college campuses, overwhelmingly liberal mm -hmm. customer base. But on the ones I know who weren't and watching this on the, the Internet at the time as well, mm -hmm. everybody identified with Cap. Conservative, liberal, didn't matter. You saw yourself in Cap. And I found that fascinating. Someone did a paper like that about that at PCA um, yeah. a few years back. And yes, um, and I didn't see that as much with the film version. Right. But it's not the film version's not as directly political. Good. Yeah, I, you're right. Well, yeah. good. <laughs> well, but it's not the film version is very much about who is right, Cap or Tony. And they mm -hmm. have a direct issue with each other. And there's mm -hmm. a, you know, there is the background issue of the Sokovia Accords, but it really is about, it's about, you know, Bucky killed Tony's mom. That's and, what, and, that's and, it's, and it's far enough removed from right. the, the beginning of the Patriot Act and all the stuff that, that Civil War was based on. Yeah. Right, right. Whereas, the, yeah, Civil War seemed, Civil War is very, very clearly an allegory for the, for, for the Patriot, Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's not a, a lot of people didn't get it. Like Civil War, the comics, I should say. Yeah. A lot of people did not get that. And I, and from, from what I understand from people who have written on this, what Wayne just said is almost universally true. Everyone, everyone was on Cap's side, but for opposite reasons, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was, which is very bizarre. Um, Cause I also like my, my reading of Civil War, my problem with that with that original story has always been um if i were writing it i probably would have chosen to put cap and tony on the opposite side that the narrative does because <laughs> uh, mm. as far as where those characters were at the time in which that story starts yeah so we resolve nothing yeah well <laughs> yeah we actually, uh, uh, my headaches <laughs> gone away so i guess this uh, well, podcast right. cures headaches uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, our new tagline. Right. Yeah. <laughs> home of the highlight. Home of the five star review. We cure headaches. <laughs> Better than Advil. Yes. <laughs> 
I don't know, like, you know, he had his headaches cured. That's a good thing. But like, how do you, I, I guess the, what we've resolved is that I, I think thought experiments are a good thing. I think, I think allegories in comics are a good thing, whatever they represent to you. I think it's, I think the exercise that Nathaniel and Chris have done is really fascinating because you are making a direct philosophical, like you're, when you're saying thought experiments, you're specifically talking about philosophy thought experiments most, right? Exactly. Like, you're not, like yeah. the, so Schrodinger's cat is a physics thought experiment, yeah. which very yeah. specifically, you know, Reed Richards theory on time travel um, of the, you know, of steady states of two universes that always that's exactly what Schrodinger's cat says. Like the cat is both alive and dead and it depends on, you know, your experience determines which timeline you follow. But that's not exactly. necessarily a philosophical one. But I think what's interesting about comics is comic geek media in general, right? Is um or and not even just geek media, I'd say all media um can do this, but I think geek media very frequently tries to get you to engage with either a philosophical, a moral, a theological, or a you know, physics thought experiment quite frequently. I mean, um, I'm thinking Flatland, the book Flatland is very much a physics thought experiment. Yeah. That's what it's about, right? Like, um, and frankly, I, I'm fine. I'm, you know, it's not an episode of Vox Popcast unless, like, unless we piss off some reader. It's fucking boring. <laughs> that, that, book's, that book yeah, is awful. Is. Yeah, <laughs> that book is, yeah. it is, or, well, I guess I already pissed somebody off. I was going to say, it's probably, I probably enjoyed it more than I enjoyed Batman versus <laughs> <laughs> I mean the terrible movie. Yes. So now, so now I'm doing the thought experiment of what what annoys me more, Batman versus Superman or Flatland. Well, I guess um, if you want more on superheroes and philosophy, you can tune into Vox Popcast in two weeks. What are we doing in two weeks? Uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier recap. Uh, oh yeah, hmm. <laughs> interesting. That's uh, um, see, there you go. Is that only um, two weeks? Time travel, man. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, so, um, but yeah, this has been interesting. I, 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 I do think it's, you know, I like how we constructed some on the air, you know, like, uh, I still think Luke is a homicidal maniac. <laughs> Nathaniel, you have not yeah, convinced yeah, me I, that he's I, justified. I, I, I sort of get the homicidal. I'm not so sure about the maniac part, but, but okay. <laughs> he, he's, he's a cold blooded killer. Then. Definitely homicidal. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is, is. You, you, well, okay. So yeah. Are you a, he's a, man, he's a man with a plan? Yeah. Are you a mm. maniac? If you, so, I mean, he clearly enjoys killing. Um, and mm. he doesn't. <laughs> all right, all but, right. But are you? A, but are you a maniac? If you are you a maniac? If you're calculating. Because he is, I will, I will grant you, he is an intelligent homicidal <laughs> murderer, mass murderer. But, but like, he doesn't just so randomly I'm, I'm, kill. I'm still going to say the people on the barge chose to be there, so I, they got what they deserved. I, I just don't feel good about that. <laughs> I just, I just don't. I just feel like you know because you're a consequentialist. This, they, they already pointed that out. This is the first time in a Star Wars conversation on this podcast where I just don't have. I don't care. Uh, no, I, I was going to say don't care. I just don't have a. I don't have a stake in this fight. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I, th I do think that it's interesting to kind of go from there to time travel, and I think it's. Um, I think there's a lot to say. So I will. I will go, Nathaniel. If people want to hear more, how would they do that? Well, well, coincidentally, Chris and I wrote a book. Uh, so we, yeah, so we wrote this book called Superhero Thought Experiments. What a great um, title for this concept. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was that. Uh... Yeah, it uh, talks about all of these and then uh, and some more. Where else do people find you if they want to follow you online or anything like that? Oh, uh, gosh. So I uh, when I'm on, um, you know, uh, backslash the Empire did nothing wrong. Um, I usually post anonymously, so I'm not going to give away <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> my my Sith identity because I've learned from the best that the Sith have to stay in hiding. Uh, so, uh, so Empire I don't, I don't did nothing a, wrong. I don't have a separate social media presence. I, um, I really... You know, do we want to do a bonus like five minutes on? Yeah, sure. Why did the Empire do nothing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Serious. Oh, 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 they probably did lots of things wrong. I just like, uh, you know, it's it's um, was a competitor intelligence. I just want to see what the other side's saying. Yeah, they did plenty of things wrong. OK, yeah, yeah no, no, for sure. Sure. Uh, just because Luke wasn't a homicidal maniac. I'm going to, oh, you know, I'm going to die on that hill. 
Uh, see, I think um, <laughs> well, you said homicidal, but not a maniac. I think the Empire did. Um, I, I think the Empire did a lot of things wrong. I do not think they were wrong just because Palpatine was evil. I think that, I, but I think they were. They clearly were very were much better at running a government than the rebels or the new um, Republic or whatever they called themselves. Because like things just fell to shit between um, between yeah, Jedi agree. and Force Awakens. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I, 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 I think they were bad. I, I think yeah, I think they were good at governing. You know, and so you're saying the trains ran that's on. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying very yeah, much the trains ran on time. <laughs> As, as my as my co-author pointed out, um, Mav, you're a consequentialist. No, I so as long I'm, as the trains <laughs> ran on time, life is good. Well, see, uh, see that's where I'll clarify. Yeah. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not saying that the trains running on time is necessarily a good thing. Well, I'm saying okay. that they were good. At, they were good at keeping the trains on time. I'm not my, sure that that's the way I would go. My question is: Is it a good thing if the trains are on time for the four people tied to this track, or the one person tied? To the other track? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, I'm a nihilist. I wonder if is there any way for me to run over both tracks at the same time? <laughs> can, can I run over the that four? Wouldn't be nihilism. No, no, wouldn't be. I'm just a, well, yeah, more a nihilism. Um, can I run on, over four? The <laughs> yeah, and then back up yeah. and then run over the other one. <laughs> Burn it all down. Uh, Chris, what about you? I, I hear you also wrote a book. <laughs> yeah, I did. Actually, I, I wrote a couple, but I wrote a couple with Nathaniel. So in addition to Superhero Thought Experiments, uh, last, gosh, what was it, last um, last fall, we have another book out, um, Superhero Thought Experiments from Bloom, uh, from uh, Iowa. Iowa. And, and Nathaniel and I also uh, published something with uh, Rutledge last fall called uh, Revising Fiction, Facts, and Faith, a Philosophical Account, which looks at reboots and retcons and sequels to the through the lens of um, what we were talking about earlier, discourses and diegesis. So that we can do, we actually have two. We're working on more, but at the moment we've published two together. So I will happily plug both of those. Both of those will be linked in the show notes. Thank you. Thank and Pile Drum Hannah. You can find me on boxpopcast.com where we post blogs about upcoming shows and you can leave us comments with your thoughts and hey, maybe you can get on the air. Yep. It's been, been known to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Frequently. Uh, Wayne, what about you? <laughs> Yeah, these days mostly here. Um, I I have my Instagram. It's in the show notes. Uh, just pretty pictures I post. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then my blog that hasn't been updated in forever. But. Yeah, my blog's also in the show notes, and I've not updated in forever. Yeah, it's been it's been well over a year since I've posted anything. So. Yeah, yeah, well, but but I, there's like ten years worth of archival stuff there. So if you've never seen my blog before, it's a whole new world of of experience. It's it's really it's really hard to be you know a blogger devoted to like critiquing pop culture when you don't leave your house for you know, <laughs> thirteen months. Um, guys, we could have just talked about Kong versus Godzilla. No, wait, it's Godzilla versus God. I, I just I, you know Kong won that movie so. Oh, it's oh, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. By 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 one I mean like one my heart, not like one any particular thing. Oh romantic yeah. spoilers, romantic Wait. spoilers. <laughs> well, I not want, like that. I want the spoilers. Not like that. Who won? I'm not gonna see that movie under any circumstances. We'll talk offline. Well, we'll we'll talk was. offline. The studio. Won? The studio won. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> the yeah, the pe- the, the yeah. people won. And frankly, Katya is winning our box office game by yeah. like you know, a, a big a big gap right now because yeah, like her movie like, made money somehow. <laughs> but but we'll, I yeah. mean, like who, we'll who would have guessed the Godzilla? Who would have guessed the Godzilla versus Kong would bring in more than Nomadland? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, we'll we'll see how this game goes because yeah. uh, she lost anyway. Minions. Yeah. Minions was going to be big. Uh, I'm going to end the show now. <laughs> yeah. Good idea. You can follow me. You can follow me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, all of the places. Always at Chris Maverick. You can follow this show all those same places at Vox Popcast, where we post links to our blog, where you can find out about new episodes and new calls for comments, which are the posts that Hannah was talking about, where you can find out about find out about what we're talking about next week or the week after that, or the I don't know, at random points in the future. Um, if you enjoy the show, which are all the present, apparently. (laughs) 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 If you enjoy the show, and we certainly hope you do, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or wherever else you get podcasts from, including YouTube. Follow our YouTube feed. This might be a very fun show to watch on YouTube. I'm going to have to pick some interesting pictures. Um, But if you follow our YouTube show, you can see an enhanced version of the show that has pictures while we talk. 
and you know like and subscribe and hit bells and whatever other youtube things the kids do i'm very old i don't really know how it works and leave us a five-star review on itunes or stitcher or spotify especially on itunes because that gooses the algorithm makes us more popular helps other people find the show and that is your duty as a deontologist that's what I, that's what that's why you were put on this planet. You are only here to broke our egos. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I would like to thank Maximilian of Thoughtform Music for our epic theme song building ever so more epically and playing us out. I'd like to thank our guests for joining us. I'd like to thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.